Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. The 12 step says having a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Uh, there are quite a few definitions of spiritual awakening. Uh, in our big book, uh, we talk about the changes necessary to, to, you know, to remain sober, happen amongst us in many different ways. When it talks later on, it talks about that we have tapped into an unsuspected inner resource that our more religious members talk about, you know, being in the consciousness of God. Uh, in the 12 and 12, it, it has a pretty big description, but it talks about being able to do, feel, and believe that which you could not before an unaided strength in your own resources alone. And then they expand on that quite a bit. I'm going to read you something from Bill Wilson here in a second. Uh, I'm not, I don't know exactly what I'm going to say. I've been a little bit worried about it, so I'm going to, I might want to wander over and around. Uh, I think everybody in this room has had a spiritual experience. I have never been, I've been to a lot of AA meetings, and we, in Minnesota, we have a lot of step discussion meetings. And I can't tell you how many 11 step or 12 step meetings and 11 step meetings I've been at where the subject goes around and we're talking about our spiritual experience. And there are young, old, black, white, rich, poor, you know, new in sobriety, not new in sobriety. And I've never, almost never, we just go around the room and everybody's talking about their spiritual experience. I mean, where would you go? <laughs> where, where would you go to have that experience? I don't know that there's, Almost any church you could walk into, including the one I attend, and put 30 people in a room and have that conversation. And have, Now, it's a little unfair because that's not a question out of their culture that they've been regularly asked. But it is a question out of our culture that we've been regularly asked. The strength, one of the great, great strengths of Alcoholics Anonymous is we do not care what you believe. We don't care what you think. We would like, but when you talk about your experience, we will listen, you know, closely, and we don't have to agree, but as long as it has integrity, as long as it's your experience, we're interested in that. And that's what everybody's looking for with respect to religion and and our higher power. They're looking for a real, they're looking for an experience, not a belief, not rules, and that's what it used to be to be a good you know, member of the tribe, whether it was Baptist, Christian, Jew, or whatever, it was, what do you believe? If you believe these three things, you're in. Okay? We don't have that. And so we define our higher power for ourselves, and we define our spiritual awakening for ourselves. There's a lot of, uh, by the time you've reached the 12th step, uh, you've gone through a lot of significant spiritual practices and spiritual experiences. And, you know, I mean, who would have believed that we would have started out making a list of resentments and having that end up significantly being the list, our men's list? And when you talk about change, what kind of a change would you have to make if I told you, Joe, that you were going to write down the people, your resentments, and then you were going to go to those people and make them, and if we told people those two things in one sentence, uh, they wouldn't. They really wouldn't want to do it. It might not go through that process. But we go through that process in, you know, four steps without even noticing that it kind of happened. That we go through that process of forgiveness. That we go through the process of cleansing. And it is extraordinary. So our program and its wisdom. <laughs> it's really isn't it wonderful that Bill Wilson decided to focus on the alcoholic rather than alcoholism. I mean, when you talk about little things, had he. Uh, decided to, uh, no, it's okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, no one has been successful with alcoholism. No one. Only two, you know, a little bit in psychiatry, a little bit in religion, 
uh, some in medicine, but no one, no one wanted to work with alcoholics, you know, because they're too too sad and, and there's no progress. It's just, you know, you're just wasting your resources and all of a sudden Bill Wilson comes around and there's a, today there's such a, a need to humanize people that we just want to tear people down and find out what's wrong with them. We're more interested in that than we are in what's right with them. Bill Wilson was one of the most extraordinary human beings that I've had the privilege of observing. I've never met him. wish I would have gone to meet him, but I didn't. I haven't. And we talk about him in kind of sometimes a adjusting sort of way that if Bob was the only member that, you know, we'd still hold the international acronym. and if Bill was the only member, he would have franchised it. But because Bill was a promoter and Bill was, Bill was our historian. Bill was the writer. So the writer, the writing in our history is more aimed at you know, New York, you know, maybe than it was in Akron. But this man, the greatest thing about Bill Wilson is he said yes. He said yes. And he just kept saying yes all the way through. But, I mean, when you talk about how do we know Bill Wilson had a spiritual experience, was that real? Look at the selfish, self-centered man his wife's working at a department store. And he had this spiritual experience. And for the next six months, he worked with 75 people, once for all his and his wife's clothing, and one committed suicide in his house. I mean, that wasn't Bill Wilson. I mean, a change? You know? I mean, it wasn't like an improvement. It was more like a sex change operation. I mean, it was, I mean, it was, it was astounding what, the, what this man did. That he goes to a meeting, and the Charles Towns offers him a job at, you know, a salary that he hasn't received for a long, long time that would have put them, and he's thrilled because it was kind of his partly his idea what he wanted. He goes back to the group, and the group says to him, you can't do that, and he obeyed. And those are his words, I obeyed. You know, he said yes. He lived in 52 different places in the two years of his early sobriety when he and Lois got kicked out of his house. Started out at Hank's. And then, you know, our founder. I mean, it was just, you couldn't have given more and not trying to reduce what Ann and Bob did. I mean, we wouldn't have Alcoholics Anonymous today if it wasn't for Ann and Bob. How Ann ended up not being a founder of Al-Anon, I will never know, but she's the mother of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I want to read, sometimes in the conversations we have in Alcoholics Anonymous, I don't... I'm a Catholic, uh, an active participating, and I grew up, I went through grade school, high school, college, and a parochial education. And uh, I lost touch with that. As soon as I found masturbation and alcohol, I kind of had a period in there that I, <laughs> that I couldn't fully participate, but it, <laughs> it was a hiatus. I came back later. And... Uh, <laughs> Got to have hobbies. <laughs> it is. Uh, hmm. uh, I don't even know why the hell I brought that up. <laughs> Not quite sure. What? Yeah, being Catholic. I don't know why the hell I brought that up. <laughs> Uh, oh, <laughs> I know I've reduced your expectations. <laughs> no, no, my goodness. <laughs> kind of reduced my own. Uh, <laughs> Every movement. Uh, in an alcoholic Anonymous over the last 15 years, or someone said, what's the most significant difference? You see, it's a movement towards orthodoxy. There's some strength in our... The most activist members of any fellowship or organization uh, have inordinate influence. You know, so our activists... Uh, but today, the, mo the, the biggest activist movement is towards orthodoxy. The strength of that is there's great sponsorship. There is an interest in the book, which I think really kind of started with Joe and Charlie, and it's been a renaissance, and now it's kind of gotten, in some areas, almost abusive, where we use the book like the Bible, and we beat each other over the head. I think if we had 
you know, if we were still getting the war veterans that we used to get in there, you know, they just wouldn't, that would not be attractive. You know, I think to the younger people that we're getting and to the people that we're getting today, it has an attraction because it's simple, it's right. People love being right. And, and it is, and it is right, and it is correct, and it is our text, and I love the book. But it is not, you know, I mean, I, I know, I know I get criticized for it. It is, in some way, just the menu. You can starve to death eating the menu. I know people who have memorized the menu that I would not want to go on a fishing trip with. Okay? The purpose of it is to take the book and put it into your life. Be the book. Be the principles, not the words. The words are never, the words cannot contain it. It's spiritual. It's of God. It is not, there is no one place where the words have it all. You cannot just go to one place and get the words and have the deal and, and control it. And the idea of making anybody else wrong because they're lame and they do not do it as well as we do it has never been an AA view. We used to be just thrilled to death if you were going to meetings and you were sober. And let us be careful about criticizing each other for not being as orthodox. There is no organization, there is no fellowship in the world that we need a spectrum we will never have all people really big book thumpers. We will never have all people who are gigantic 12 steppers. We don't need that. We're a, you know, we need noses, we need ears, we need legs, we need hands. We do not need all of any one thing. And if you open yourself up to God, you will learn what your thing is to is to bring. You will you will do service. It will happen to you what happened to Bill Wilson. You can't have a spiritual awakening and not do service. Period. I mean just I don't care what it is. You will just have you will have a different view of life. It will not be the same. But it will not be perfect. And I'm gonna read So there's a guy who wrote a book uh about Bill Wilson. His name's Mel Barger, sober sixty two or three or four years. And uh, in that book, he, 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 he quotes a letter from Bill Wilson. So Barger meets Bill Wilson in 1951. He has a conversation with him. He's really new in sobriety. And later on, he, he wants to meet him again. And the two things he wants to talk about is he wants to talk about Bill's spiritual awakening. And he wants to talk about why, in his opinion, the 12 and 12 is less positive that's the other thing. The really conservative members of AA think God wrote the big book. They think Bill wrote the 12 and 12 in his garage. It is not, I mean, there is there is an idea that, you know, that somehow Bill did not write the 12 and 12, that it, it isn't held with the same respect. And for a lot of us that have been around for a while, we think there's some pretty good stuff in there, including the traditions, <laughs> I would point out, that that there are copied by a hundred and some different organizations and been able to stay together. This group staying together? <laughs> Give me a break. Uh, and Bill's writing in 1956 to Mel, and he's saying, I often fail to make the point that every AA who has had a program gets the same thing. The only difference I can see that most experiences, talking about the spiritual experience, are strung over a long period of time in these sudden events or strung out over a long period of time. In, the, in these sudden events, I think the ego gives way to a depth in a complete collapse momentarily. This permits a huge inrush of grace that brings, a, it brings in a vision. In most cases, that grace leaks in a little at a time. Therefore, I can't hold that there's anything particularly special about the, the sudden experiences. He said, if you were to sum up all your own transformations, uh, that you've had since you've been an Alcoholics Anonymous, and condense the whole business into six minutes, you would see the stars and more. So he's saying we've all had, you know, the bits and pieces of our spiritual experience have been handed us a little bit at a time over a period of time, and they've changed us. I mean, how who could have gotten 400 people to sit in a room and have the conversation we've had this weekend? And I know that most of you have been to five or six or seven similar events like this. Why would you come again? <laughs> to remind ourselves. I mean, we're bringing our damp log to the campfire of AA. 
I mean, it is that is what we do. There is a story. Tell me again, Dad. You know, you know how little kids want the book read over. You know, it's five, six, ten, fifth. That's my favorite book. Read me the book again. So we gather together in rooms like this, and we build a bonfire, and we bring our damp logs in the room, and we tell our story. And it is the story of Christmas. It is, and we want to be reminded one more time, because when we're out there, it's tough to hold with uh, the depth and the consistency that we would like to hold it. And uh, Bill talks about... Well, he goes on in the letter to, to talk about his depression. He goes on in the letter to talk about that he thought Dr. Bob was a hell of a lot more spiritual than he was, and he goes on in the letter to talk about that all the sins that he didn't have time for when he was actively drinking, he had time for in his sobriety. And uh, <laughs> uh, But I want to notice that in 1956, a man with 22 years of sobriety is writing to a guy with five years of sobriety. He's the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he is as open as any person I've ever seen in the world. There is no pride that's standing in his way. He's had a spiritual awakening, and he's talking about his life in real terms, his depression, his participation in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I don't know that many of us would be able to do that, that we would... So I think we need to be speakers. So many times when we're telling our story, we're giving you kind of a wrapped version of our lives with a bow on it. We're talking about these significant, you know, then I went broke. And we talk about how we went through that. And I went broke once and almost tried. And when I tell that story, I can tell it in two or three minutes. And it sounds like I used the program and I went through it and it was okay. I spent six months under my desk sucking my thumb in the fetal position <laughs> okay, with 25 years of sobriety. Okay? Now, I, don't have the, I would not have the time to tell you all of that. But, I mean, I spent, you know, <laughs> I'd go to AA meetings, and I'd cry all the way through the AA meeting. Look at that guy over there. He's got 25 years. <laughs> How'd you like to have what he? I think he's got the clap. I'm not sure that I. Want... <laughs> I'm not sure I want what he has. <laughs> uh, so, if uh, as a guy who's been around for a while, if someone said, "What is the biggest?" Uh, impediment. So people, many people, the, the stories have been very po powerful this weekend. Deb's story about how she found her higher power and what's been going on in her life. I mean, those are profound stories, and we get deeply touched by them. Uh, I think the biggest problem that we have, I have as an individual in AA is that I bring my psychology to my recovery. I bring a knife to a gunfight. I bring my mind, I bring what I know as a solution to my life. And, uh, you know, if you drew a circle and said there's what you know, I mean, the whole circle is everything there is to know. You take a slice out of the pie, that's what you know. You take a slice out of the pie, it's what you don't know. And everything else in the pie is what you don't know and don't know you don't know. The Almost everything that is of any significance to us in our recovery comes from what I don't know and don't know, I don't know. Now, I may have known at one time, and I may have heard the words, but I, not, I don't know it in a way that makes a difference. And uh, I think there is a tendency in Alcoholics Anonymous to say the more information I have, the better I understand the books, the more I know about the steps, that I can manage my life. We, do, we would not use those words. But that's what the world says. Get the, Get the tip. Get the right answer. Come in here. Take some notes. Okay? I'm going to hear this guy in step four and five. He's terrific. I've missed something. None of us are missing any information. There isn't anybody in this room that needs more information about themselves. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we might need a little insight about ourselves, but we don't need any more data about ourselves for sure. The interpretation of the data certainly would would be. And 
in that process, if I'm just trying to put some rubber on the tire, that you have, you know, that I think I know so much. You come to my house and you got a problem? My tendency is to tell you what the answer is. And do I have an answer? Yeah. I, I mean, I, at one level, I've got an answer. Do I, at another level, do I have an answer? No. It's spiritual. You, I mean, if, if it was mechanical, every time you had a problem, you'd just say the third step prayer and click your heels, you'd be back in Kansas. I'm serious. There would be nothing missing. And when we get together and we talk, and, and, and the complexity sometimes, the, and I'm the worst. I'm a re- reader. I have a lot of different things that I've read. And I think if we give people the, sometimes we give the people the impression of the complexity of the steps, that you have to have a master's degree to adequately go through the steps. And I mean, when you're in a room full of AAs, I mean, you've got IQs going from 80 to 140. You've got ages going from 19 to 80 or above. You know, I mean, we're, we're not the same. You know, we have people who have a great capacity and spiritual interest. We have people that have no, not much capacity and not much interest in what we would call spiritual. There are some people that have no interest in spiritual that are spiritual. <laughs> and there are people that have great intellectual information about spirituality that aren't very spiritual. And so, I mean, the experience is an individual experience when we go through the steps. I believe that, you know, in my own thing, I was 24 years old. I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous. I was 23 years old when I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous. I was a uh, kid from a upper middle class Catholic family. I went to Notre Dame, drank my way to the University of Notre Dame, middle of my senior year, in the yearbook, class ring, walked out. That's our story, by the way. We we interview well. We just don't do well. <laughs> um, when I went back to make amends to the first job I had, the guy said, "God, you interviewed so well." I said, "Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we that's we do." Uh, <laughs> and uh, I jokingly say, my mother always said, "Bob, you're not very bright. Dress well." And I have uh, that has. Always been kind of, you know, that thing where we always say we look around and we take a look at other people and kind of get our cues from what they expect or what they want, and then we do that. We we do that because we are really insecure people, and we want we want people to like us and so forth. Uh, I just gave away everything there was. Once I found alcohol, I mean, I just loved it. I loved who I did it with. I loved where I did it. I remember all the guys. I remember they went to the uh, Indianapolis 500. And uh, there were six of them. It was going to cost about 60 bucks to go on the trip on the cheap, or maybe it was 100 I went and bought three-fifths. I got an overstuffed chair from the TV room down the stairs, lugged it up to the third floor in my room, and, you know, read War and Peace. It was my, <laughs> that was my weekend. I mean, why go someplace and spend 100 bucks to go do what I can do in my room? And uh, came home, finished college. My dad asked me to leave home. Last year of my drinking, I'm drinking pretty regularly a fifth a day. I'm living on Skid Row. I work at a liquor store for six months. I work as a waiter for six months. Uh, no one knows where I am, which is fine with me. I just, I am lost. I just don't, do not have a clue. I'm a guy who's got all the advantage. You know, my, my buddy says, I was born on third base and I congratulate myself for hitting the triple. I was born on third base. I worked my way back to home plate <laughs> the wrong way. Uh, and I end up coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, and it would be hard for me to explain. You know, I, I was a mystery. I had my parents convinced that school was really tough until my brother went down and graduated <laughs> magna cum laude. Uh, then they kind of got a sense that maybe it wasn't quite as tough as I said it was. Uh, walking in a room. So... When I reach my moment of truth, I'm hugging a toilet one morning in July 1967, doing my morning exercises. Hadn't been to work in four days. I do not know if I have a job. I do not know if my fiancé is going to stay my fiancé. I do not know if the family is going to let me live in the house until I'm married. I panic. I call Alcoholics Anonymous. Two men come out. One was six months. One was six years at a cafe. And they tell me their story, and they changed my life. 
changed my life. Not to, I mean, I've been to every brand of help a young person can have. Two guys, <laughs> six months, six years. One guy's a the potted potter, we called him. He was a potter. And another guy made braces. I forget the term. Uh, doesn't matter. And I went to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I met my sponsor at my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Sat me down in a chair and said, alcoholism is a disease, physical, mental, and spiritual. Once you're crossing the line from problem drinking to alcoholism, your alcoholism affects you all the time when you're drinking and when you're not drinking. The idea that my alcoholism could affect me when I was not drinking, big idea. No one, no one gave me that sense. They told me I was an alcoholic and told me I had a drinking problem. I never had a sense that it was mental, spiritual, and physical. He said, well, we do an alcoholic Anonymous. When we take our last drink, we use the 12 steps to change to find a different way to live. If you don't change, you're not going to stay. Gettysburg Address of Alcoholics Anonymous, compressed. My sponsor was a mailman, a powerful, ordinary guy. <laughs> Second World War vet, lost half his crew. He was in the bomb disposal unit in Italy. You talk about men today. If we have anything in our lives that's kind of fancy, we talk about it. I remember Bob, my mentor from Texas. I'm having lunch one day, and Buck, and I got converse says, God, we can get free license plates. I said, free license plates? He said, yeah. <laughs> Prisoners of war get free license plate in Texas. Now, I've known Bob for quite a number of years. I said, you're a prisoner of war? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, both these two men, and I'm saying, you guys never talk about it. He said, well, no, you don't. He said, everybody, the only way you got there, when we got there, is you got shot out of a plane. There were no ground troops. So we had one guy glance off a mountain, got shot off a plane and glanced off a mountain and lived. We had another guy that was in a tail, uh, tail got shot off and he lived. Bob got in a fist fight with a German, kicked the crap out of him. He got his crew out, parachutes on fire, goes in the deal, he escapes. At the end of the war, he escapes with another guy. Long story short, but they end up in a town. They go in, and they finally are so hungry that they go into a town to surrender, and the town surrenders to them. <laughs> because the town wanted to be in the hands of Americans rather than Russians. And, I mean, you know, this... But he never mentioned that in his AA talk. I mean, that was never, those men never talked about that in their AA talk. I mean, would I talk about that in my A talk? How'd that be the first half of my talk? I mean, it would be. But there was a humility. Uh, and then there was, so I'm in this room with these 30 or 40 men when I walk into Alcoholics Anonymous, and they're really attractive folks. There's two women and 30 guys. And I was to learn about Alcoholics Anonymous. I quickly learned that Alcoholics Anonymous wasn't about not drinking. I thought it was going to be about not drinking. And there's a stay after the meeting. They're talking about all the steps and so forth. And if we, to the very best of our ability, and our ability changes. So when you first come in, I think, did you get a spiritual awakening? I think, yes. I didn't used to think that. When the book talks about around the four step where it says first we get well spiritually, then we get well physically and emotionally, I thought that was wrong. One of the few things in the book I've disagreed with. I thought, first you go well physically. I'm a young guy. Then you get well emotionally. And, and spirituality is the most sophisticated aspect of our program. That's the third thing that happens. I don't believe that anymore. I believe that something happened to me that allowed me to go to a meeting a day. I believe something happened to me that allowed me to pick a mailman as my mentor and follow him around, and I was going to be his wingman and do much of what he would tell me to do. I mean, that's a change, not a small change. I believe that that was my spiritual awakening. I believe our, our initial spiritual awakening for many of us or most of us has to do with abstinence and has to do with our physical sobriety and has to do with our participation in Alcoholics Anonymous. My second collapse came at eight years of sobriety, seven and a half or eight years of sobriety, where I had all these defects of character, work issues. You know, couldn't get to work, couldn't stay at work, couldn't work at work. Other than that, good worker. Um, <laughs> money problems, gambling problems. But what I'm most ashamed of is I, we had children, and I was loud and patient, angry, and sometimes violent with my children. Not I'm proud of that, but that is the way I was. And... uh so I had unmanageability issues in every area of my life. Now today, I, I, you know, then I just I was comparing myself to 50-year-old guys. 
You know, today, if I had a 23-year-old with those problems, would I be shocked? I would not be shocked, but I was, it was a different time. Man up, do, <clears throat> you know, get with, <laughs> to do the job. And I was, you know, failing in every area of my life, and I got to eight years of sobriety, and I'm not thinking about drinking, but I'm going to put a gun in my mouth. Just a story of my life. I start well, I don't finish anything. I am so goddamn sick and tired of <laughs> throwing a hand grenade in the son of a bitch every six months. Here I am again. And uh, I'm screwed. Because I know the answer is to go to God. And if I go to God, what do you think God's going to say to a guy who can't work, gambles, spends more money than he should, isn't as kind and loving to his wife? I mean, you have to be a genius to figure out what God's going to want me to do. I mean, you, I know the list. What the hell do you think I've been trying to do for the last six or seven years? What the hell is the use of developing a relationship with your higher power if you can't fulfill the conditions of the relationship? I was stuck in that place for two and a half years. And finally, out of just fear of being a sober jerk, I went back to the steps third time. Powerless and unmanageable? Hell yes. You know. Know what I lost? Step two. Believed it for us, but not for me. I mean, I, I don't know how that's possible, but that, I mean, I, that's a sincere statement as I could make. I could tell you as a new guy that I, without question, if I thought you came in here and did the steps and got a sponsor and, and didn't drink, you were going to be okay. I thought, <laughs> what did I think about me? I, I don't know. I mean, cause I was not okay. And uh, took the three for the first time on my knees with my sponsor. I mean, I'd taken the step before, but not on my knees, not with my sponsor. Did my third fourth step. Uh, and in the early day, my, my first fourth step was a recitation of the worst things I had done. It did not get into the causes and conditions of my alcoholism. When we talk about, like today, where we're going to take, we, we think we have such a better class of newcomers than we than we were. I mean, think back to your first four-step, guys. I mean, how many of those were really fancy? You know, you talk about 130 names on the list. You know, I don't, unless it was my name, it wasn't going to be on the list 130 times. You know, it was, you know, no one had 50 pages when I came in. I mean, there just wasn't, it just wasn't that way. And I'm not trying to diss the process today, but I'm saying if we make it so complicated, what complicates it is Intellect and mind and psychology. This is a matter of heart. When the old, when, when the people who are back to basics talk about it, we're going to go back. I mean, you can do the steps in two days. We're going to go over. You know, Don Pritz took me to the steps in you know one day. You know, Doctor Bob Clarence went over there and they talked. They took Clarence through the steps in one day. When Earl Treat went through and he, you know, the, you know, Clarence talks about you know 19 guys came in and visited him in the hospital. And no one, they just told them their story, he never told them how the hell they did it. And the last day, Dr. Bob came in and told them how he did it. Okay. Now you can't do what we've done this weekend in, you know. So the essence of it, you, you just, it is, I mean, taking this program on is a little bit like drinking out of a fire hydrant. And, it's, and for many of us, our first fourth step was like a third grade art project that our mommies put on the refrigerator. It was not, it was not what I would stand up. It wasn't what Sheldon talked about. And I love what you talked about. But my f first two four steps were not that. They were the best I was. And I'm not a bozo, and I'm not like I don't care, and it wasn't like I didn't try. They just weren't that. And it wasn't that until the third time. And I've done 20 since. And I don't think I've done one better than I did when I was eight years sober. And I went to my sponsor and I said, you know, I'm dying of thirst lying next to a lake. I am so goddamn tired of being who I am, doing what I'm doing. He said, I'm going to do my fist up. And when you're done, be careful because I'm going to do whatever the hell you recommend that I do. I did the fist up. He sent me to a psychologist. I hated that. Psychologist wanted my wife involved. I hated that. When your wife's in the room, it's a different conversation, guys, just in case you... It's a different data bank, just a distant, you know. So, okay. and what I found was fear. I had done three inventories. I fear was dog snakes and tall buildings. I had, no, I had zero insight 
into being afraid of being a husband, a father, and being a worker. And I had a second spiritual experience at eight years of sobriety. Once you have taken these principles and steps into your life and you start, the mystery is that now that I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and now that I have these steps and now that I have this information, now that I have a relationship, I can go out and do life. Your life is still unmanageable. Life, by its nature, is unmanageable. With a spiritual grounding, you can navigate it, but you cannot control it. And the mind wants to control it. Give me the data. Give me the information. Throw me a tip. Tell me what to do. I just went to this special seminar. I have the best sponsor in the world. My sponsor knows more about the fourth step than anybody in the world. We do, you know, this. We do that. And now I have the right stuff. Well, that's not going to get you there. That's going to get you to the door. But if you want, you got to add the power. Power doesn't come from the data, and the power doesn't come from the information, the power doesn't come from the mind. I was sleepwalking through my life. I still sleepwalk through my life sometime. But having had a spiritual awakening, I am more awake today. I do not strike children. I'm in love with my wife. I am a better person today than I have ever been. Am I still a jerk? Yeah. Because it's like riding a bicycle. I do not have to be. <laughs> I, every once in a while, I just do asshole. It is just. Uh, <laughs> and if you could. I mean, if the Olympics were going to have an asshole team, wouldn't this room be a great place to recruit? I mean, it, <laughs> and we congratulate ourselves on our great spiritual growth. <laughs> And, and we ought to, to some extent, there ought to be a level of humility. I, I know that's borderline language, but it is the right word. <clears throat> and, you know, we are problem people, as Bill Wilson talked about. And do we have a spiritual way? I just think it's astounding that this group of rugged individuals come someplace and spend two days having a conversation about God. And that's what the hell did I start? When when the did I start at ten thirty? I started at ten. Ten ten thirty? Okay. Uh, we come in here with a conversation with an internal dialogue that's killing us. Alcoholics are not afraid to die. We're afraid to live. I mean, when you go to a room like this and you say you're not afraid to die, everybody goes, almost everybody understands that we're not afraid to die. I mean, you could go, you, there aren't many rooms you could go into, guys and gals, where you could, you, you couldn't go into many churches and say that. Uh, we're afraid to live. We can do the extraordinary. We can't do the ordinary. Can have relationships, can't stay married. Can't balance our checkbooks, can't get car insurance. Have jobs, but not careers. We're not, you know, we're, and we're not under-equipped. We are not under-equipped. But it is, uh, do you know how scary that is? To have all the equipment and not be able to demonstrate it. And what, the power's got to be at it. And, uh, you know, the power comes through our program. The program are spiritual principles. When they're applied to our lives, we change. And I believe it comes, it gets deeper. I mean, why are we here with an average of close to 10 years of sobriety in this room? Why are we here having this conversation? Because we want it deepened. We want a reminder. We want to, all of us have, is anybody here short of material to work on? Now, outsiders, you know, would say, well, <laughs> you're still working on it? I mean, what kind of an organization? <laughs> I mean, they don't get it. You know, they, they just don't get it. I go, I go south for the winter, and they're saying, you know, you're an AA, yeah? You don't drink, yeah? How long? Uh, 45 years. You know, you still go? Yeah. Why? 
Ask my wife. <laughs> Ask my wife. <laughs> Ask my children. Yes, my uh, my business partner. My business partner is going to have 50 years of sobriety in January. We've been partners for 43 years. I am now retired, so I'm not here, there day to day, but he and my son run the company. Uh, I just am trying to throw into the fact that life is not controllable. And when you walk around with the it's not manageable, and when we walk around with the idea that it is, we then kind of have the obligation of being the God of our own lives. And it, that's an untruth. And it doesn't work. And it, when it doesn't work enough, you have two choices. You either have to have a breakdown in that system, or you have to find a chemical or something to do where you can hide. Your bar room. And it could be sex, it could be gambling, it could be booze, it could be drugs. It would be something to get you out of the fact that your life doesn't work and you don't know how to work it and you don't know how to live your life. You know, under the mystery, and the world tells you that you can control it. Just do the right thing, get the right stuff. So the message is out there, I mean, that, and that's what, you know, uh, so I've wandered through that, I guess, enough. Uh, I think the gift that we've been given in Alcoholics Anonymous the most astounding thing to me, and it's an idea that I've never had until the last couple of years, is that we have been given the gift to replicate spiritual experiences. I mean, <laughs> where the hell else would you go that if you had a problem that is so deep that you needed a spiritual experience to recover from it, to be restored, where would you go? And we do it. Not everybody, you know, not a guarantee, but we do it regularly and often and are not shocked or surprised. We are a little bit in awe. It is quite wonderful when you get individually people who come up to the audience to tell you their story. And you go get reminded again. I mean, that's why the newcomer the most important person in the room. I mean, it's like that joke about the ministers on the bench waiting for the bus at the bottom of the hill and the little kid's on top of the hill with the bike and he comes down the hill and <clears> the <throat> bike gets out of control and he goes head over tea kettle and tears his pants and cuts his leg and the wheel bends and the little kid stands up and says, son of a bitch. And the minister walks over and says, son, don't talk. He said, you know, the next time that something like that happens, I want you to say, Jesus, help me. Six months later, kid's on top of the hill. The bike comes down the hill. Kid, you know, head over tea kettle, tears his leg, cuts, cuts his leg, tears his pants, bends the wheel. And he stands up and he says, Jesus, help me. And the wheel straightens out and the, the cut heels and the pants come together. And the minister says, son of a bitch. <laughs> It is. It is. And that's why, <laughs> and that is why we come together. That's why we come to the bonfire of Alcoholics Anonymous with our damp log, to be reminded, to be able to see that, because each time we forget we are so self-contained. Okay. And we come in here with a conversation when I said we were not afraid to die. We have a conversation that is killing us. And what Alcoholics Anonymous is, one of the things it is, is a new conversation. And it's a conversation of recovery. It's a conversation of a higher power. It's a conversation of program. It's a conversation of sponsorship. It's a, ultimately, it's a conversation of love. And when Deb talked this morning about being kind of in the presence, when Chamberlain was asked in a new pair of glasses how he prayed, and he said constantly, and he was a reader, you know, he read Lawrence, and he, you know, he had that idea that, you know, of practicing the presence. And I don't think we realize how much we pray. I don't think we realize how much the spiritual has invaded our psyche, our intellect, 
and where it's just we swim in it. We examine almost everything that happens to us on a daily basis with respect to it. So when your husband dies, you can have that almost automatically. You're having a spiritual conversation about an event that would pop almost anybody into craziness. We are problem people. We are used to, we had a crisis in our family uh, a, year, a year or so ago where one of our members ended up in prison. And I just look at people who are not trained the way we are trained to deal with life. And if you have to deal with life with your own resources, even or, I don't know. But I'm just impressed. If we would have thrown that problem to many of the people in the room, it would, it would have been a horrible problem to have. I don't know. A pretty tough problem. But it's not a problem that we would find horribly unusual and not one that we would thought that we didn't have the resources and strength to handle. Once we have the spiritual awakening that we've talked about, uh, we try to carry the message to alcoholics. Alcoholics Anonymous is a volunteer organization. We have no paid help other than the, our general service office and the intergroup office that we have. So we have a, we have a structure that, that helps enable 12-step work to get done. I, I couldn't be more pleased. I'm an admirer of, of Billy Noonan, and I think that we are blessed to have you in our service structure, and I think it's really good stuff. I'm very pleased to what we do. We need uh, that leadership. We need that structure. We need the vehicle which those services go through, and many of us should re reconsider. I was active in service for a considerable period of time. It's not part of my general service. is not part of that part of my life today, but it's always had a warm spot in my heart. But if we don't do it, no one's going to do it. There is no one else to do it. And because of the spiritual awakening, the 12-step work that we do, it's interesting that in the big book, all Bill talks about is doing 12-step work. In the 12 and 12, he spends a couple of pages talking about it, but the rest of it is talking about how to practice the principles in all your affairs and about the spiritual awakening. A difference, again, that he was sober, you know, 18 years when the book was published. And uh, there's just a different, you know, the book is, a, I think, a deepening of some of what we're talking about. But sometimes when the hotshot speakers come in from out of town and you get the impression that we sponsor, I you know, 35 guys, or I go to, you know, nine meetings a week. I go to, personally go to four or five meetings a week. I sponsor quite a few guys. Uh, I could tell you half a dozen different things that I do. I meditate, I read, I do different things. I'm 70 years old. I'm 46 years sober. I didn't do that when I was 25. I didn't do it when I was 30. I mean, I can do it now, some of it, but I... But, again, this perception, when we're given an AA talk, that that's what I did. Well, it's, it is what I do, and as I've been doing it for, you know, quite some time. But it isn't always what I did. I wasn't able to do that when I was younger. I'm ADD. I'm 60 miles an hour head first, no helmet, spring-loaded, narcissistic, <laughs> you know, self-centered son of a gun. And I don't, you know, I mean, it was... I had a guy walk out of a meeting, stand up at a meeting, point at me and said, look at that guy, he's a nervous, I, I twitch a little bit. And he, he said, look at that guy, he's a nervous wreck, that's what alcoholics I was up for, I don't want any point of it, and he left. And he went down, down the stairs. I went out after him, I said, listen, you jerk, I'm better. <laughs> it is. And and uh, once you've had so the process of Alcoholics Anonymous, as it works on us, is a process of a change of heart, not a change of head. We do get information, yes, but the information over a period of time becomes wisdom. It, it becomes part of the core. I mean, it, it isn't. Again, we're interested in your experience, not your ideas, not your beliefs. What we're interested in is your wisdom. And there's a font of wisdom. I mean, I, I started going to a, I go to a three or four, six thirty in the morning meetings, and one of them is just chuck full of guys in sober houses. Yeah. When I first went there, I thought, why do I like this meeting? There aren't, you know, there's only, you know, five or six guys that are gals that have much sobriety, and the rest of them. But I'm hearing stuff. Well, I'm hearing stuff because they're on target. They're doing difficult things. There's 10 people sharing a bathroom. Would you go back and do that, Bob? 
I mean, you candy ass. Would you like to go back and do what the people in the, in the, in the room are doing? And you're less full of crap at 6.30 in the morning than you are at 6 o'clock at night. You are. I mean, I really think that one of that conversation is a more gentle, loving conversation. It's impressive. But it is, uh, guys, we've been given a gift that is just so far beyond. We come in here because our pants are on fire. And we stay. The opportunity is to stay to find recovery. Not abstinence. Not a, not a removal of the problem. But something that allows us to do something we've never been able to do, to live life on life's terms. To be full participating people. If that change has happened to you, the 12-step work, which I'm, I have kind of a choice of what I'm going to do for the rest of the time, uh, I believe you will do the 12-step work automatically. I believe that our responsibility is to keep our eyes open to what gets presented to us. I think that, you know, and I have known people who, it's interesting, I've known people who are, I would say, were relatively kind of lame members of Alcoholics Anonymous for 20 years. And all of a sudden they get on fire. <laughs> I got guys that are 65 years old that are, you know, no longer real active in their jobs that are sponsoring five or six guys that are just, and they're just attractive as crap to the young people in the group. And they're, you know, they're just perfect for what they're doing now. They, and they didn't, you, you might have criticized them because they were doing their lawyer thing and they weren't doing as much work as you want them to do in the group, you know, when they were, but they stayed. And they kept their lives in order. Okay. You, you, you just don't know. It is the negative application of spiritual principles is the rectum of spiritual principles. We do not need to know what is wrong with people's application of the spiritual principles. What's attractive and powerful is the positive application of the spiritual principles. The attractive application. What Billy was talking about, rather than the rules and the laws and the, <clears throat> you know, is to talk about, you know, when you start to hear about those things, you get tears here. I was watching Scott, and he just, you know, I mean, you know, he was in tears about four times. And he's kind of sloppy, but, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, when Billy was talking, because it was, those were touching sorts of things. And lastly, I, I, I'm, so I'm going to kind of go over, I think we talk an awful lot about 12-step work. I'm active in 12-step work. I sponsor men. I'm bringing guys through the steps. I don't think I do that as well as most people do it, uh, but I do it as well as I'm able to do it. I think my strength is that if you came to me for advice, I get a lot of men who have been sober a while who are having trouble. And with those men, I'm able to have a conversation about life that is connected to the steps and the principles and the steps. I think that's my strength. And uh, my life's changing. It's hard for me. I'm gone four months a year. I'm gone, you know, the rest of the time I've gone half the weekends. Should I sponsor someone who's new? I mean, these, these are quite, I was always right in the middle of it, starting conferences and doing the stuff. And it's different today. So am I, at what point are you so lame you should not be given talks or whatever? whatever the conversation is, Life changes, and maybe what your role is in the life, it doesn't always stay the same. It may be different at 46 years of sobriety than it is at 20 years of sobriety. Who knows? But I, need, I, wanna, I, don't, I do not want to become marginalized, and I want to be able to answer the call that my higher power is asking me to do in the program. Uh, and I've asked some questions about whether I'm doing, how well I'm doing that the last number of years. AA has become so big that you can damn near live your life in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, which I do not think is the design of Alcoholics Anonymous. The purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous is to return you to life, not be your life. The principles, the relationship with your God, is to be your life. So it isn't like, okay, but to spend your whole time in the structure of Alcoholics Anonymous, that's not what it's meant to be. It's meant to return you to your families, to your job, to your marriages, you know, to your parenting, to your civic responsibility. It is, and when you're newly sober, I don't think you can do it too much. When you're newly sober, you can live in the fellowship. We need to plant that conversation so strongly in our minds that this is not a bowling league. An hour a day is not going to get it done. It's not going to impede the conversation that damn near killed us to get us to the front door of Alcoholics Anonymous. We need to seep ourselves in that conversation and in those steps and in that process and build our foundation. 
So the process of recovery to me is once you come to Alcoholics Anonymous, they deliver a semi-truck trailer to your front yard. And in that semi-truck trailer is a boat kit. And you're to build the boat kit that's going to take you on a journey for the rest of your life. Almost no new person wants to build a boat. Can I borrow your boat? That's a... (laughs) That's a hell of a boat you've got there. (laughs) How many bedrooms do you have in that boat? Uh, We do not want to take the time to build our own boat. Hopefully, most of us, you really don't have to build it alone. What happens is, you know, if you get into the right group, guys will come over and help you build your boat. But you will not be, you know, what most of us want to do is strap a couple of logs together, throw them in the river, get going. I've I've, I've got some stuff to do. (laughs) Some things I have to pay attention to. We do not want to build the boat. And if you listen to anything with the men and women that you're up here listening to, uh, they built the boat. Not perfectly, but they built the boat. And it is, uh, and that's what our recovery is. And in that process, uh, we are able to go back to life and attend to things. You watch the guys in the sober houses, uh, in treatment and in the sober house, they can conform. One of the great pamphlets in Alcoholics Anonymous is uh, Thibault's pam- pamphlet on conformity versus surrender, or surrender versus compliance. And he talks about, and he said, you, it looks the same. You can't tell the difference between, you know, compliance and surrender. And you wonder why, you know, so you can, in a big group, you can do what everybody else is doing, but if you're complying, you haven't had the change of heart. You're not fully in the game. And that is what this, that is what opens the, the spiritual experience. Once you've had the spiritual experience, you'll still make mistakes. You'll still do stuff wrong, but you'll be here, and you'll start to do the things and redo the things that you that, that you need to do. And little by slowly, you will start to gain the wisdom and strength that we're talking about. But the full measure of our recovery is to be able to attend to life, to be able to be things that. I was never able to do. I mean, today for me to be able to be a, a decent husband and to be, today for me to be a, a decent parent and today for me to be self-supporting and those different things was something that I was never able to do. And it was, and I wasn't under-equipped. I just wasn't able to do them. And uh, so to me, if we would keep into our... So I think we have a little too much focus. It's easier to do AA than it is to do life. It's easier to do AA than it is to do marriage. It's easier to do AA than it is to have kids. So a lot of us overdid AA at the expense of I wasn't <laughs> didn't spend as much time helping raise my children as I should have. Now, would I go back and do it any differently? I don't know. I'm just telling you that as I compare myself to my brothers and different people that I know, they're better parents. And, and when, the, when the kids were younger, they were better parents. I think I'm a fine parent to my children now. <clears throat> but I wasn't then, and I wasn't in my sobriety. I made a lot of mistakes in my sobriety. But I stayed active. I did the deal. I tried to do the steps. I had a sponsor. I, I did, you know. And what happens is the corners get knocked off. What happens over a period of time is you start to get to me. The principles seep into my life. And not just by action. I don't want to make this sound like, you know, that you can get it by, you know, environment. It was, I mean, I've been a step worker since I have <laughs> came into Alcoholics Anonymous. But I do want to plant the idea that the purpose of our program is to return us to life, not just to be our whole life. And to do that, we're going to need everything that the steps offers. And we're going to need to do, you know, we're going to need to do the 12-step work and to practice these principles in all our affairs. What a gift it is to be end up having have a disease that in order to get well from it, we've had to become better people. I mean, that is what, you know, in order to get well from it, we've had to learn how to live life. In order to get well from it, we've had to move from a taker to a giver. It is just extraordinary. There's something special about the people in this room. There's something special about the people in this area. I don't know. I, uh, so I want to thank you for my experience this weekend. I love you. God bless.
much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.